I'm delighted to welcome you inside the Arizona State Museum's Pottery Vault, which houses more than 24,000 whole ceramic vessels from the U.S. Southwest and Northwest Mexico. Hi everyone, my name is Patrick Lyons. I'm an archaeologist, an associate professor of anthropology, and the director of the Arizona State Museum. In this tour, I will give you a brief overview of ASM's whole vessel collection, beginning with recent material, and then we'll move back through time. Okay, when I said that we had more than 24,000 pots, the way that that breaks down in terms of time is as follows. About 75% of the collection is what we would call, as synonyms, archeological, prehistoric, or prehispanic. That means that about 25% of the collection is what we would call recent, ethnographic, or historic. Uh, what we're going to do is start with a quick look at some ethnographic pottery, and then we'll move on to some archaeological pottery. So what we're looking at here is one of the best collections of early historic Hopi pottery known to exist. And um, a piece that I like to show folks every time we do a tour is this particular one. Uh, and I always ask people what they think it might have been used for, what its function was. And uh, most people decide that it looks like a soap dish, and it kind of does. But the correct answer is that it is a holy water dispenser. So if you'd grown up in a Catholic household like I had, you'd be used to dipping your fingers in this and blessing yourself when you entered the home. Now, of course, this is not a traditional Hopi vessel form. Uh, it is not associated with traditional Hopi culture. However, the reason I show this piece to folks is it reminds me and it reminds the people I'm giving a tour uh, that uh, ASM is an anthropological museum, which means that we collect everything from fine art to household implements to tourist tchotchkes. And that's because uh, we are focused on the intersection of the native cultures of the Southwest and uh, the Western cash and wage economy and all of the economic, political, social, and religious consequences of that interaction. And a really good window into that intersection or that interaction is the curio trade. And that's why I grabbed that particular piece. Uh, that piece dates to the period when, um, right after the railroads came through in uh, the Northern Southwest, and that was a period of time when Pueblo potters, mostly women, were able for the first time to really access uh, the Western cash and wage economy. And they did so in a very innovative way. They started to make vessel forms that were small, but also useful in an Anglo household so that visitors coming on buckboards from the train station could tuck them in their satchels and take them back to New York or Chicago or St. Louis or wherever. And so that's the period when we start to see um, things like candlesticks, or candlestick holders, I should say, um, the holy water container, um, ashtrays, um, all sorts of things like that, uh, salt and pepper shakers, coffee creamers, things that would, again, be useful in an Anglo household, but are not really traditional vessel forms uh, when it comes to Hopi culture or Pueblo culture in general. Okay, one of the great things about this storage system that we have, uh, beyond the fact that it's a compactor system which saves a lot of space, it's very flexible so it allows us to put um, drawers like this in different places where we have different uh, small assemblages of things that uh, are interesting and important. And um, I was just talking about the curio trade in that period of time when potters began to innovate and make things that were small that could be taken home as souvenirs and we start to see uh, the manufacture of lots of uh, miniature vessels during that period of time but also uh, a new industry comes out uh, tiles and again these are the sorts of things that would be easy to tuck into a pocket and take back east to your home to use as a trivet or to put on your mantle, um, all sorts of things. And early on in uh, the late 1800s, the, the dominant iconography, the decoration that we see on these 
is Katsinam, or the ancestor spirits of the Hopi. One of the things that really distinguishes this collection from others, besides its depth and breadth and size and documentation, is uh, the fact that we have assemblages like this, the unfired work of a master potter. Um, I'm sure many of you have heard of Nampeo, a first mesa. She's a matriarch. She was responsible for reviving traditional Hopi pottery making in terms of the traditional vessel forms and motifs and color schemes. And uh, what you're looking at here in this drawer uh, are two pottery making sequences, one that produces a bowl and one that produces a jar. And the only piece that's fired here is this one that I'm going to pick up. Now, in 1928, an archaeologist named Harold Gladwin hired Nampeo to make these pottery making sequences. And he photographed the whole thing. And he also purchased from her not only the stages of manufacture, but the raw materials that she used and also the tools that she used to produce these vessels. Uh, we also have unfired pottery made by other matriarchs from other tribes. But this is truly phenomenal. Those of you at home no doubt are familiar with the photographer Ansel Adams, but did you know that he gave his prints and archives and other things to the University of Arizona to help establish the Center for Creative Photography? You're probably asking yourself, why are you talking about Ansel Adams when you're in the Arizona State Museum's Pottery Vault? That's a great question. Thank you for asking. I'm talking about Ansel Adams because we happen to have his dishes. Why is that important, you ask? Another very good question. It's important because he had commissioned the matriarch of San Ildefonso, or Eastern Pueblo, an Eastern Pueblo group, to produce the dishes that he and his family ate off of. And that matriarch would be Maria Martinez. And we have this 30-piece place setting. Uh, a number of these, well, two of these pieces are actually in the wall of pots that you can come see. This is another place I like to stop on tours because it reminds me to tell folks that of the 24,000 whole vessels in this room, less than five are real thrown. That means that everything else that you're looking at today was made by hand. It was hand built using the coil and scrape technique or the paddle and anvil technique. Uh, this is a, a, an exception right here, this vessel that I have my hand on. This is a wheel-thrown, old-world-style stoneware with glaze uh, that was made by a Navajo potter named Romain Begay. And even though he makes use of a number of old-world uh, technologies, he manages to get traditional Navajo iconography into the piece. This is the lid for that jar, and it has the Ye'i or Ye'bichai iconography that you see right there. So we were talking about Nampeo a little while ago. These are some examples of pots uh, that were made by Nampeo and by members of her family. Many generations later, uh, her relatives are still making uh, very highly regarded pottery and carrying on the styles that she introduced. Here we've reached the intersection of ethnographic or recent or historic pottery and ancient or pre-Hispanic pottery. And what we've done here is we have ethnographic Mexico up against archaeological Mexico. And there are some reasons for that that I'll talk about in a minute. But on tours, I always like to point out these really big jars down here. That even though they're cracked, they're kept kind of held together with uh, rawhide thongs and baling wire and wooden shims and different kinds of natural adhesives. And the reason for that is these are Tariamara ciguinos. Uh, these are jars that are used for brewing corn beer. And so when you've got a good pot that's brewing good beer, you want to keep it in use for as long as possible. One of the key reasons that we built this state-of-the-art curation facility for our world-class collection was so that we could make it available 
to all kinds of users, principally researchers, not just uh, professors and other professional researchers, but also graduate students, and also for the use of native artists in particular, but also uh, so that we could tour people around uh, to see Arizona's heritage and the region's heritage. Um, one quick point to make, though, about access is that um, this collection that I'm pointing at right now on this side of this aisle is the largest collection of Casas Grandes or Paquime related material that we know of that is curated outside of Mexico. It includes more than 2,000 specimens. And just since we've been able to move it into the Pottery Vault, it's been the subject of not one but two PhD dissertations. One from the University of Oklahoma and one from the University of California at Riverside. Now again, it's not just archaeologists and anthropologists who use these collections. Uh, as you remember, a little while back we were looking at ethnographic pottery and we are very, very proud that we have lots of native artists come in and uh, they're often looking to see things made by their mothers, their grandmothers, or even their distant ancestors in order to uh, seek inspiration. And uh, that's a, a great use of this collection as well. Uh, I mentioned that uh, there was a reason we had modern Mexico or ethnographic Mexico up against ancient Mexico. And the reason for that is a kind of pottery that's referred to as Mata Ortiz pottery that uh, we'll take a look at. But while we're here next to the Casas Grandes or Pachyme material, I'll mention that Mata Ortiz, which is uh, modern, which is contemporary being made today, was inspired by this ancient material, especially the iconography that you see here of the macaws and other kinds of animals and uh, often the color schemes, things like that. Uh, but also, uh, early on, I'll find an example, here we go. Early on, um, when Mata Ortiz Pate was first being made, there was an attempt to actually copy the ancient human effigies. The guy who was responsible for the phenomenon, Juan Quezada, was making things that pretty much were copying, like this copies, those ancient materials that he would see in the archaeological sites all around where he lived in northwestern Chihuahua. However, it didn't take all that long for him to develop a new approach that made use of designs that came from that ancient tradition, but he wedded them with a bunch of different techniques and inspiration from other groups uh, in the Southwest and did all kinds of experimentation and then also taught friends and family how to make pottery and it took off as a real phenomenon to where many 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 different people in northwestern Chihuahua in the villages there around Mata Ortiz make this pottery and make a living in doing it. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about something you may have heard about, but you might not have, and that's NAGPRA, or the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. That's a federal law that was uh, enacted in 1990 that required all museums and all federal agencies and all entities that had within their custody Native American human remains, funerary objects, that is objects from graves, sacred objects, or objects of cultural patrimony, something that uh, belongs to a group but not an individual, say the Washington Monument or the original copy of the Declaration of Independence, you get the idea. If a museum or agency or entity had any of those things or had human remains in its custody, it was required to do an inventory and to share those inventories with federal agencies, with, with the National Park, Park Service, I should say, and with uh, tribes in the United States. Uh, there was then a claims process, and if there is a valid claim by a descendant native community, uh, the museum or the agency or whatever entity, university, sheriff's department, has to turn over those objects and those human remains to the rightful claimant. And uh, ASM has been very, very active in NAGPRA since it was 
started in 1990, and actually we began repatriating well before it was required by law. Our first repatriations happened in the 1930s. And uh, ASM is responsible for administering the state's version of NAGPRA, which applies to human remains and funerary objects and some other kinds of objects found on state, county, municipal lands in Arizona, as well as private lands in Arizona. Now, I'm telling you all this about NAGPRA and about uh, funerary objects because um, there is a collection that we have called the Norton Allen Collection that uh, typically would not be seen by the public. It would not be featured in tours. It would not be photographed. It would not be in exhibits. However, the tribe with the best claim for affiliation, which is claimed affiliation, is the Tohono O'odham Nation. And they have created a legal relationship with ASM such that this collection will always be available for research, education, outreach, exhibit, all those sorts of things. And, and objects from this collection have been on exhibit at O'odham Museums in the past. And so uh, with that bit of introduction, we'll take you over to, to uh, look at those materials. So this is the largest extant collection of whole Hohokam ceramic vessels. Uh, Hohokam, of course, being the name that archaeologists use to refer to the ancient people of the southern deserts of Arizona, of the Phoenix Basin and the Tucson Basin and, and places nearby. Uh, it's called the Norton Allen Collection because it was collected by a man named Norton Allen, who was an avocational archaeologist, meaning a non-professional archaeologist. However, we talk about him as being perhaps the first salvage archaeologist. Uh, he began excavating in the area around Gila Bend, Arizona, in the 1930s, in the years before there were laws on the book, like on the books, like there are today which protect archaeological sites, or at least require archaeologists to go and take a look before there's ground disturbing activity that involves public land, public money, or a permit from a public agency. And so uh, when Norton Allen first started coming to southern Arizona, he realized that a lot of large scale ground disturbing activity related to cotton agriculture right along the Gila River and Gila Bend was destroying archaeological sites. And so he took it upon himself to ask permission of, of private property owners, state agencies, federal agencies, and tribes to excavate portions of these sites before they were destroyed by agricultural activities or construction. And he did this for 40 years. And as a result, there are more than a thousand specimens of whole pottery uh, in that collection and thousands and thousands and thousands of shell objects, stone objects, and other things that were collected by Norton Allen. And it's because of him, largely, that we know a lot about the Hohokam of, uh, west, of southwestern Arizona. And there are a few great things about this collection. It actually documents um, all of Hohokam decorated pottery making all the way from the 600s to the 1400s. And many, many specimens have uh, iconography that shows different life forms, like these birds. This is uh, referred to as quail. I know it looks like the upper and lower beak, but that upper line that you see is supposed to be the top knot, and the lower is the beak. Bighorn sheep, scorpions, more bird iconography there. Some folks have said these look like pelicans, which actually do get blown into Arizona from time to time. I hope that you enjoyed this video tour of the Arizona State Museum's Pottery Vault and that this will inspire you to come visit us sometime soon and experience our exhibits, events, and public programs.